in this edition of Detroit Performs, a band stays true to its funk roots. We're, we're a funk band and we do funk music, you know, we don't dally and a whole lot of other stuff. It's deep funk. Spice it around. Girl, wanna get to yeah. Critic Card Detroit shares with us more of their art reviews. I highly recommend that everyone come to this exhibit. It's a beautiful representation of a lot of the fantastic artists that are in the city that often don't get um, the recognition that they deserve. An actor becomes a playwright after a life-changing experience. You know, I mean, in this play, the character changes into a better person regardless if he lives or dies. And an artist who's taking masking tape to a new level. Every year I try and expand into a new medium and what that involves is creating like a simple process of working that involves very minimal tools that can be made by hand and can be made everywhere, but it's also modular. It's all ahead on today's episode of Detroit Performs. Major funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the McGregor Fund. Additional funding is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Detroit Performs, everybody. I am your host, DJ Oliver, and I'm coming to you from the Scarab Club, founded in 1907 by a group of artists and art lovers. The club, which is open to the public, has been bringing creative minds together through art, music, and literature ever since. Our first segment features a deep funk band that will put the dip back in your hips and the job in your stride. Here are the Third Coast Kings. Ladies and gentlemen, we are the Third Coast Kings. We love the fact that you are here right now. Get ready to get down, because it's been a long week. And now, we are all here together. Don't get it wrong, don't get it twisted. Friday night, let's get lifted. I know you're all standing around, but by the time we're done, I want to see y'all having some disco fun. I had a few different bands that I had been working on, and um, I guess I sort of realized that there was a certain type of music that I was I was getting closer to, and it's something that was more meaningful to me, and that was funk music. It was it was more like a subgenre of the deep funk, the deep soul, stuff like that. And uh, I started looking around on the internet, and I I ended up finding a bass player, and uh, my guitar player was Steve, who's actually now the bass player. So. We put the band together and it was a few different things, um, a few different names. We were the Monarchs, we were Styles Davis. So we eventually settled down on, on the Third Coast Kings, which was where we got serious. And uh, we decided that this was gonna be the thing that you know, we, we would launch to, to the public. Well, I love the feeling of it. I guess, I mean, you could call that the soul of it or the groove or something like that, but I just, I think um, it makes you feel good, it makes you want to move. What this band is as if James Brown during the years 1968 and 1975 had maybe a little bit more jazzy horn sections. The charts are almost a little more slice of bebop and big band jazz um, with a drummer that's playing at a little different tempo than the James Brown songs. My direction was um some of the old school funk stuff, some of the obscure stuff. It's something that's it's got a lot more power to it, it's got a lot of uh, feeling to it, and it's harder to find. So there were a lot of DJs that were digging up these records, you know, looking for this deep funk sound. And, uh, you know, once I locked into that and started following what they were doing, that's where I discovered our sound. Spice it around. Yeah. See, a tidal wave of Monet's when you caress my face and my camera love your skin tone, so I even love your cell phone. Call me, and we'll simulate the making of waves, cause you're so special. 
I mean, it came from soul music, it came from Motown, and at the same time, there were so many other bands, the, you know, in the big sea of things, there were all these little fish that were trying to compete for the same sound. And uh, the stuff that we try to recreate are those little fish. It's, you know, track eight, side two of an album they own, but they didn't hear it more than the first time, so it's like, oh, wow. And so I guess a lot of our songs that we write that are ours, uh, we try to have that, oh wow, factor. I'm winning so much in this. We're a funk band and we do funk music, you know, we don't dally in a whole lot of other stuff. It's deep funk, you know, and people get it, you know, when they when they hear us. And honestly, as complicated as my life is sometimes, it's, it's, it's nice to be like, this is what it is. It's one thing that we do. You can focus on that. It's all got to have a foundation. It's like a house for us. It's, um, it always starts with me and my bass player. We come up with some grooves. From there, once we have something that we like, we'll record it and then send it off to the horn players and they write on top of that. I just play the rhythm that I know is, uh, is the right sound, it's the right fit, and then uh, I leave the guys to the rest. You know, we interact, you know, it's, all, it's a nice creative process. You know, we'll spend time in the think tank and um, it always works out. You don't see a lot of bands with that many people in them. We've got, you know, guitar, bass, drums, trumpet, trombone, saxophone, two singers, so eight people. I think it's a, it's a simple sound. It's very, you have um, the horns, which have a very specific kind of sound, and then the driving rhythm section. Um, and I think we try to, we really try to make our music as simple as possible and kind of stripped down to the style. I think that's where the deep funk comes in, is that it's, it's really supposed to be just about that, that groove at the center of it all. Now imagine. You are in a 1982 Cutlass Supreme. And you are driving down Woodward in Detroit, Michigan. We are influenced by Detroit a lot. Our, our, our upcoming album, um, you know, we've got some song titles on there about Detroit, West Grand Boulevard, Mayors of Detroit. I mean, the, the heritage of Detroit, the music is is huge, you know, so it's very inspiring, you know, in that regard, and there's a lot, there's a lot of good funk. What this song is all about. I think musically, Detroit's got an incredibly deep musical history. So, I mean, for me, it's something that's very special to be a part of it in some way and s somehow try to continue that history that's there. Um, I think we have a huge responsibility to try to represent Detroit in the best way we can. In fact, to me, if we say we lived anywhere in Michigan, called ourselves a funk band, and didn't try to play in Detroit, then that's a penalty, that's a personal foul. If you're near Mecca, you go to Mecca. You can go anywhere on this planet and say, we're from Detroit. And people will have to lay down a little bit of respect, whether they've heard you or not. But Detroit has that grit that makes the funk great. Hey, if you wanna get some, you better leave some. If you wanna get some, you better leave some. Music lives on. For us, this kind of music was deeply important. I just want other people to feel that, really. And so if we can play it and some other person will hear it, maybe they don't even know it's funk, but maybe they'll go look up a musician, go, go try to find um, some other music that's like this and keep the, keep the tradition alive. We love you. Good night. In 2013, the Third Coast Kings received a nomination for Outstanding Urban or Funk Group or Artist from the Detroit Music Awards. To learn more about the Third Coast Kings, head to DetroitPerforms.org. 
Let's check out what Critic Card Detroit has been up to as they share with us more critiques on Detroit arts events. Hello, my name is Sarah Aldridge and I am at Alyssa BK and Kenny Corbin's art exhibit in Southwest Detroit. Um, I highly recommend that everyone come to this exhibit. It's a beautiful representation of a lot of the fantastic artists that are in the city that often don't get um, the recognition that they deserve. Kenny's photographs show um, a life often not seen and focused on um, throughout the city of factory workers. Um, tells a very beautiful narrative of something that is not often seen um, in the city. And as far as Alyssa goes, she uses some very beautiful color and touches again on a lot of the Latino um, history that is in the city that often goes overlooked. Um, and again, tells a very beautiful narrative through her paintings. You can view more of Critic Card Detroit's citizen reviews on their Facebook page and YouTube channel, which you can find through DetroitReforms.org. Next up, a University of Michigan theater graduate who turns his life-threatening experience with an illness into a new creative outlet for himself, as well as a way to help others facing the same intimidating journey. Here is Alex Kipp and his play, My Other Voice. Alex, you have cancer. Every once in a while, you're in, you're in it, and you're going over the lines, and then you realize that this moment actually happened. We need to start him on a regimen of R-CHOP right away. Okay, English, What's please. What's that? R-CHOP's an acronym for rituximab, cyclophosphate. Cliff notes, please! It's chemotherapy. This isn't some abstract play written 100 years ago. Um, this happened a few years ago. The person it happened to is the author and in the room. We don't have much time. The tumor's growing. We need to start the steroids tonight and chemo in two days. Where well, he's very interested in telling a powerful story. We want to move you to the cancer wing tonight. Do you have any questions? No, I'm scared. We're going to take good care of you. He explains the story very well, but also brings in hope for everyone. I mean, it's not just a story of cancer that's really depressing. At the end of the day, it's really hopeful and exciting. Days will come when you don't have the strength. And all you feel is you're not worth well, I've been doing theater since I was really young. Uh, it started in church, actually. Ever since then, I pretty much have always been doing it. I never expected to write a play. I don't even know who said it first. He sort of said, I, I want to write a play, and I said, you should write a play. And so it sort of started there, and he started bringing in scenes and started reading them, and it's been a really kind of amazing evolution. So I ended up going to the University of Michigan and I studied musical theater there. So everyone's plan after graduation is to sort of hit New York, you know, full force. We do this big showcase where we sing in front of all these agents. So my senior year, it's a big year when you're supposed to get ready for the showcase and all this stuff and you're singing all the time, but my voice was like completely failing. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it in the world. This lovely feeling of being. What you're seeing. Obviously, you can't be singing in front of all these agents in New York City. So that's when we got some more tests and they found this big cloud, this dark cloud in my chest. And then they examined it more and realized it was a tumor. And then from there, realized it was non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Don't get worked up about it, just relax. We'll be back soon. And the expectation early on was, you know, oh, this is very treatable. We've seen a lot of people do really, really well on this treatment. You know, we're going to do six rounds of chemotherapy. It's going to be about six months. After that, you should be totally fine. We don't know if your voice will come back. Hopefully it will. Um, but you should be, you know, clear and good to go. I thought you said the pills were working. No, they're not working. Alex, you have to let me know if things aren't working. Oh, and then, you know, the six months rolls around, and at first they say, okay, everything's good, we're great. And then two weeks later I get a call, and they're like, actually, we found something that we missed. And you need to come back, and actually we need to do a stem cell transplant now. Which is when it really shifted for me, because then it was like really, really much more dramatic and much more life-threatening. We're basically rebooting the system. It's like hitting a restart button. We drain out the cancer, 
we put in healthy new stem cells and they begin to reproduce and make new blood cells. And the thing about Alex is what I, uh, I just appreciate him, even as I've gotten to know him more, is that he's a fighter, that he you know, wasn't going to go down without a fight, no matter what news he was going to get, and he was going to live the life that he knew that he was created to live. Oh my God, what's going on? What, what did you do to him? Relax, I'm just kidding. There are scenes in the play that he didn't actually see. Um, one of the things that happened was realizing that people protected him from certain aspects of their experience and yet wanting to honor those characters and go more deeply into that. So, for example, there's a moment where his mother really falls apart with his sister. There's a moment where his dad really falls apart with his best friend. You think it's easy watching my best friend die? God, he's not dying! You know, we know how it ends, but you know, when you're preparing a play, you want to make sure that the audience goes on that journey with you. It's like they're in the hospital room, right? They're dealing with this. It's like their son. It's like their dad. You know, it's they feel like they're a part of this family. You're not gonna die, okay? Well, I think one of the things that's inspired me throughout this process is how honest Alex is in the telling of his story and how generous and I think when one's telling an autobiographical story there's an impulse sometimes to make oneself seem a certain way and he's been absolutely egoless in terms of letting go of any sense of how he might want to seem in order to tell the greater story and to think about how that story might serve patients and physicians and families and just the larger world. This is seriously torture. I don't even care anymore, okay? Oh, Mr. Kip, it could be a serious infection. It could be a collapsed lung. It could be a strain of a virus that's killing innocent small children. You know, because obviously it's based off my experience, but it's not word for word. Some of these characters are a combination of characters. Some of these characters didn't exist. So it's sort of like creating a world in which you can rectify what happened to show that there are really, you know, People who go through this, it can be a really debilitating thing, but it can also be a life-changing thing for the better. You know, I mean, in this play, the character changes into a better person, regardless if he lives or dies. We are treasured, we are sacred, we are blessed. Like, I feel like this is a play about cancer, but it's also a play about growing up, and a play about sort of having a different kind of wisdom about your role in the world and what truly matters. At the end, it brings everyone up, and um, I think shows it shows me, especially even being in it, what kind of person I want to be at the end of the day. We are treasured. We are sacred. We are. Alex Kipp is a healthy guy now pursuing his dreams in New York. To find out more about him and his play, My Other Voice, head to DetroitPerforms.org. And now let's check out some upcoming arts events happening in and around Detroit. Danny Scheibel has spent more than seven years and 10,000 hours creating what he calls Tape City, or Tapeopolis. Rob Stewart takes us into Danny's sprawling Tape City. Well, 
I am fascinated by the artist we have found for you today, an amazing artist, Danny Scheibel. Good to see you, Danny. Good to see you, Rob. And we are sitting in the middle of Tate City. This is one of the coolest things I think I've ever seen. Oh, thank you so much. What is this? What we're sitting in the middle of, it's a city that's been made out of masking tape, but really what it is is it's a modular sculpture. Okay. And I refer to it as an interactive social sculpture. Okay, what does that mean? I make my art everywhere I go, and I make it so I can interact with people and show them that art is just the same as going to work. It's just the same as doing, you know, like your chores. It's just the same as going out and getting a drink. It's a way in which you approach life. And I also encourage people to make it with me when I go out. Every year I try and expand into a new medium and what that involves is creating like a simple process of working that involves very minimal tools that can be made by hand and can be made everywhere but it's also modular and giving people the opportunity to actually become part of my art installation. Well, literally, you and I are a part of it right now. That's why yeah. I wanted to do this interview down on the floor so we could bring you right into Tape City. You said Tapeopolis. Sometimes Tapeopolis. <laughs> it has many names, depending on where it is. And I encourage people to actually name their favorite buildings. They're also modular, so say, you know, if you were to want to change one of the buildings, if I wasn't happy with it, or if I wanted to make it new, say it, I had a new idea and I wanted to change the architecture, you can literally pick up any piece of the sculpture and just make it bigger. I've found that oftentimes people make assumptions about the way in which they're going to interact with the world. And I found art to be the best tool to use to get people out of that everyday assumption. Like they'll be going through their day and they'll just assume that it's going to go in a set pattern of like events that are going to happen. It's like it's Monday, I'm going to wake up, I'm going to go to work, I'm going to like see these people. To give them something new, something that they can engage with and just like, you know, take a break. So how long have you been doing this, and can you even put a guess on how many creations you've made? Oh, a guess on? Well, I mean, I've there's been, thousands of them in I've here I've been today. doing it for seven years every day, and I would, I would probably say that it's made out of 100,000 individual oh. pieces. Talk to me about the lamps. I am constantly trying to expand and figure out new ways of not only displaying but working with the tape and so applying light to a sculpture is something that you do as as any artist has to pay attention to their light if it's a painter it's the quality of the light entering the paint and coming back out a sculptor it's how do you light your work well just so happens that the tape like lighting it from behind revealed an entire new quality and also we see models here wearing uh, pieces that you've made for jewelry yes all my art's temporal. Mm -hmm. It's made so it's forced to be remade. My sculptures and my installations are like mandalas, and they're a way so I can reach a point of clarity in myself, but also so I can remake who I am. So it's, it's made to come apart and to be remade, and it allows me to be free. Sometimes you get confined by your objects and the things that you own and the idea and more of the concept of who you think you are. And so to be able to constantly rearrange who you are allows me to change my ideas very freely and openly and adapt to new situations and just become a person I want to be instead of the person I think I am. When I just sit here listening to you, I'm, I'm just fascinated by you because not only do you have the work of an artist, but you've got the, the spirit and the soul of an artist. No, thank you. So if you could say something for the art, if you could say something for these thousands of creations, what would you say for them? Um, I would say that the fallacy of normality creates the banality of our reality. <laughs> Very well said. I think that people are the most interesting, unique, creative, spontaneous, wondrous sources of not only like inspiration, but also of like meaning and connectedness that you can achieve in the world. Well, I, I think that is an excellent way to end the interview. Danny, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for having us here in the middle of this awesome creation, Tape City. And we'll give you one for the road. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. To find out more about Danny Scheibel's Tape Agami, as well as all the other artists seen in today's show, visit DetroitPerforms.org. And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. As always, for more arts and culture, visit DetroitPerforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on upcoming arts events. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. 
We'd like to thank the Scarab Club for letting us come down and enjoy this historic aspect of Detroit. I'll assure you, you want to come down and check out this place for yourself. Until next time, get out there and show the world how Detroit performs, y'all. I am DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Major funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the McGregor Fund. Additional funding is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts. And by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.